I would like to call the February 24th, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. Number one, approval of the minutes from the January 21st, 2014 Planning Board meeting, followed by the Hills Subdivision Amendment, followed by the Normal High Water Line Zoning Ordinance Amendment, and public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. So first item, approval of the minutes from January 21st. Anyone have any comments? I just had yes. one little thing. Mm -hmm. One picky thing. I'm trying to keep up with you, Victoria. <laughs> um, on page two, where it talks about Eric Martin at 45 Royalsboro Road, he's in Durham, New Hampshire, and I think we should be specific, so we oh. don't think he's in Durham, Maine. Okay. That's all. I didn't realize that. Thank you for picking up on that. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments or questions? No, then anyone like to make a motion? Sure. Move to accept the minutes. Oh. Okay, second. Second, thank you. On all approved. And the minutes have passed. Mm -hmm. Yes, we. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the Hill Subdivision Amendment. Eric Hills is requesting an amendment to the previous approved Mitchell Highland subdivision to divide a lot located at 27 Kildare Road to create a second lot with proposed access to Astor Lane. This is under section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivisions. The application will be in the following format. There will be an introduction of the item by the town planner, followed by a presentation by the applicant's representative. The board will then determine if sufficient information has been submitted to consider the amendment, and if the board would like, we can discuss a site walk, public hearing to be scheduled in the future, and the board may discuss this application followed by a motion for the board to consider. Uh, Maureen, would you like to give sure. us an overview? Thank um, you. I'm familiar with the Mitchell Highlands subdivision, not because I was the planner here then, but because it's adjacent to the Cottage Brook subdivision, and we had to do a lot of background research on the Mitchell Highlands subdivision as part of that. So the Mitchell Highlands subdivision is that road, Cottage, um, excuse me, Columbus Road, Kildare Road. It was approved in phases in the 1960s, and at the end, uh, the corner of Kildare, where it intersects with Cottage Brook, Eric Kills owns a lot and at the time that the Cottage Brook subdivision was approved it was laid out so that that lot could be subdivided and it functionally looks like it's part of the Cottage Brook subdivision but it remains part of the Mitchell Highland subdivision so this would be an amendment to an approval that the Planning Board granted back in the 1960s uh, it's in the RC district and the minimum lot size in the RC district is 20,000 square feet so lot 46 becomes lot 46 and lot 46 a each with at least 20,000 square feet this is uh, the Mitchell Highland subdivision was not a cluster subdivision those didn't exist back in the 1960s so it has to comply with the standards for the RC district and not the standards for the Cottage Brook subdivision so um, unless there's any questions I'm gonna stop there any questions? No. Would the applicant's representative like to present? Thank you, Chair. I'm Bob McCaff with Mitchell Associates. And Mr. Hills apologizes for not being here tonight. He came down with the flu and felt it was better to stay home than give it to you folks. So, uh, Very kind. As Maureen kind of outlined, uh, the existing parcel in question is, uh, is this one right in here? Oh, we were before the board the last time. Uh, we were talking about the uh, being able to divide this off with the frontage being on to the uh, Cottage Brook subdivision. And what I've got to do now is since my marker's gone off of that, this is the lot in here. This is the Cottage Brook subdivision or Springwink Woods. And this is the access road that the new lot will actually come off of. And this is the proposed configuration for the parcel. This is the front portion that will still remain with its frontage on Kildare. This will be the second lot, which will be 20,200 square feet, and will have access onto Astor. Uh, one of the issues raised by the board the last time we were here with some concerns you know, during the workshop session was in terms of rights to having access to Astor Lane. Astor Lane is currently under construction. It'll be requested by the developers sometime late this summer, early fall, to be taken over by the town, in which case it will be a town road. 
and the Hills will have, an after, have access rights to that road. And they're coordinating with the folks from Quadrant. Yeah, boy, excuse me, Cottage Brook to extend utility stubs uh, as they're doing the utilities in Astro Lane, and they will be stubbed to the property line uh, to address future needs on that lot. And as I said, one of the issues I know had been raised by the board was a concern that they didn't have legal rights to a road that basically was part of a subdivision until it was taken over as a private road, uh, until it was taken over as a town road. So we've actually shown a couple of conditions on the plan. One is that the lot could not be conveyed or a permit taken out to build anything on that lot until such time as the property uh, has right to Astral Lane as a town road. That being said, Mr. Hills has no intention right now of doing anything with that lot. He's just proceeding with dividing the lot as a future ability to either sell it or develop it. But there's nothing in the immediate uh, horizon from the do anything to that parcel. So we felt that that condition would hopefully address what the board's concerns were in terms of having uh, rights and access to Aster. Uh, one of the other conditions we're asking for is there's a, the open space impact fee that's required when a new lot is created. And we're asking that a, uh, it's a condition of approval that that be waived until such time as either the lot is sold or a building permit is pulled out on that. Uh, and I forget exactly what the fee is now. It's about $7,000, I believe it was. Uh, rather than having to pay for that at this point, requesting the ability to have that extended until such time again as either the lot is sold or he uh, goes ahead to build a home on that. Uh, we're also asking for one temporary waiver. It's, we do not have a survey stamp on the plan right now, but we will for the public hearing for a final signature. So, so those are the basically an overview of that. You did receive a letter uh, from uh, Cottage Brook from Spurwink LLC that talked about their intention in terms of uh, approaching the town for takeover of the road uh, for the for the file. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Does anyone on the board have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Is Chicory Way, is that simply to access uh, this lot 39? Chicory it's not Way. Up there, it's on your in. plan. I, I'm, I'm going to assist because um, Chicory Way was put in as part of the Cottage Brook subdivision. It's an emergency access way. So uh, when the construction is completed on Cottage Brook, there will be a gate installed on Chicory Way so that there will not be through traffic between the new subdivision and the existing. Oh, it's going to connect to Kildare. Um, but there will be a gate. Yeah. So it will only be available for emergency access saved by the fire department. Th there's not a home on number 39 right now, correct? Um, it's not a building? Number 39 is a, yes. Because if I noticed that um, yes, it's there part, is, there is a home? There was, okay. there is a, there, yes, there was. There was an exist that there was a home built on that lot as part of the Mitchell Highland subdivision. The mm -hmm. lot was purchased by the Cottage Brook Development Group, mm -hmm. and then they um, added that lot to the Cottage Brook subdivision mm -hmm. and took some of the land from it to create Chicory Way. Okay, that's their affordable housing lot, and it yes. is their affordable housing lot. Yes. Okay. And so, just to be clear, the. The new lot is not in the Cottage Brook subdivision? Correct. Okay. The, the applicant could choose to amend the Cottage Brook subdivision and add this lot to it. They are not electing to do that. Peter. Yeah. <coughs> pardon me. There seems to be an informal undertaking to <coughs> pardon me, extend the utilities uh, so that that lot and look up to it once it's uh, become part of the public way is is the informality of that arrangement more typical or is it, do you ever look for a written agreement to actually i've had a call on this from the public works director and um, it's actually not that uncommon during construction of a major subdivision if there are people on site doing utility work that you provide extra utility connections to abutting property owners so that's that's not uncommon, and that's it's being treated as nothing more than a field change. Uh, Morning. I had a question for you in, in regards to the open space impact fee. Would this arrangement be setting any precedent, or is this arrangement um, okay with the town? I mean, the, the, the concern with the open space impact fee payment is if you can imagine if you have like a thirty lot subdivision and 
people are never happy with writing these checks and you have to extract that money from 30 individual lot owners, that's just not fun. So the ordinance says it has to be provide, paid for by the developer. So you have one unhappy person as opposed to 30 individually unhappy people. However, requiring that it be paid before the lot is sold, we've already done that once. Um, there was a four lot subdivision on Hannaford Cove Road, I'm pretty sure Liza remembers it. And in that case, the uh, developer was settling an estate and asked to have time to pay it at the time they were selling the lots and they and they did do it and it, it worked out fine. So I think there's already some precedent for pushing this back a little bit. Okay. I want to clarify. Yes, Liz. So I have a question related to that. So Maureen, how how would we enforce that, say if it's um, the slot gets developed ten years from now? I'm just worried that it might be easy not to pay the fee. Well, we, we put a note on the plan that says that you, you can't sell the lot without having this fee paid. And the expectation is that um, when someone comes forward for a building permit, the code officer would know that there's a subdivision plan and would check the plan. Um, I also provide a copy of the approval letter, which you could include a condition, this condition on the approval. Um, to the code officer so he could put it in the file. So th there is some risk, but um, we haven't, to be honest, we haven't had a problem with this fee being paid. Yeah, because I could just see a situation where 10 years from now, the land gets sold, whoever buys it doesn't know, they go to pull a, pull a permit, it's an unwelcome surprise, we, the town backs down, there are hard feelings. We have, uh, we have drafted a note that's actually on the plan as a condition, so it's part of a recording, so anybody who buys the lot, that note is on the plan. So, I mean, I drafted the language for Maureen, obviously, to review and your town attorney as far as it satisfies it, but basically says that the lot cannot be sold or building permit pulled on, pulled until such time as that impact is. And, and do people pull the plan before they buy a, a lot, typically, only because I've never bought land before, but buying a house, I've never gone to the town and pulled the subdivision plan. But if, but to be fair, Liza, if you were to, if I was the owner of the lot and I didn't pay the fee and I still sold it to someone, they pull out the subdivision plan, it seems to me that the new purchaser would have very strong grounds for coming back to me and saying, you were supposed to pay this fee and you didn't pay it. So. Well, this would never get past a title examination. It's almost like a cloud on title, really. really? You're, you're not going to sell that lot without paying the fee. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. you're, you're Interesting. All right, good. I mean, we, I, we want to be careful. I mean, mm -hmm. even though there's a note on the plan, you probably also want to make it a condition of approval if you're going to be approving this so that it's, it's pretty clear that this is something that has to happen. But we had this happen once already on Hanford Cove Road, and all of those fees got paid. Yeah, right. But those are being sold, you know, in short order. Well, we don't know how soon this will be yeah. sold. It could be in six months. It could be in ten. You, you never know. Even with Hannaford Cove Road, you don't know how soon they're being sold. But but they paid the, all three with the first sale. They paid yep. all the three permits all at once. Yeah. So but we have one lot, one permit. Exactly. So and we we do all kinds of agreements based on. What before a building permit can be issued, so there is a way to to enforce it at the time, uh, and I'm assuming the fee is the the uh, responsibility of the seller, not the buyer. And uh, but uh, if someone in this day and age, if someone's buying land and they're not pulling pulling uh, plans, they're on dangerous ground because there are all kinds of different agreements that are made 10 years back that you need to be aware of. Right. Bob's nodding his head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the applicant, I think that's a reasonable request. I'm sorry. As I say, the applicant has suggested a condition of approval. I see it on the plat, and we can put it into our, our mo motion right. for next month when we do the public hearing. If, this has, if everyone's read the condition of approval, if we want to make any changes to it, but he, they're already suggesting putting it into. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other? Just a, yes. in looking at your plan up there, mm -hmm. I see that you've changed the setback, so you've got them all set. It. Yes, we corrected those. Okay. I think what happened because it was adjacent to Cottage Brook, 
took the zoning from the Cottage Brook plan and was put okay. on early, so that's been corrected. The information on stormwater, do we yeah. need that? I was going to ask you that also, Maureen, is um, no information provided on uh, movement of surface water, stormwater, landscaping. The response is it's one line. That's what I was wondering. What we're weighing. That's yeah. my feeling. Uh, how does the rest of the board feel that information is not presented on uh, stormwater landscaping? If my personal um, it's one lot. <laughs> well, one question would be what is uh, what is the existing existing buffering required? I guess. The houses on Kilter Road are part of are not are part of a subdivision. The houses on Kildeer are part of the original subdivision that this lot is part of. And in the 1960s, there was no okay, requirement. So I'm going to guess that subdivision had no requirements for buffering. Correct. Okay. So no other comments about the lack of information regarding also stormwater. Movement of surface water. I, no, no I comments. Don't have an issue one with that. lot. Okay. All right. I think that was the only questions and comments that I have. Um, does the public have the opportunity to speak tonight? On completeness. Do, on com right, on completeness. Does anyone else have any questions, Bob? At this time, then, I'm going to just ask if the public would like to speak on completeness of this application seeing no one well close that part um, at this point then um, so you've made the changes we requested then why don't we just go ahead and say does anyone want to do a site walk does anyone want to I am not seeing anyone no site walk then okay would, should we hold a public hearing next month on this? Sure. Why don't we do that? <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. Would, would you like a motion to Then I would like that? a motion to go with that. <laughs> motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Eric Hiltz for an amendment to the Mitchell Highland subdivision to divide lot 46 into two lots with access for the new lot from Astor Lane be tabled to the March 18th, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Okay. I'm only hesitating. Don't we have a completeness motion, too? Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, you actually no, you have to. Uh, because, it, yeah, because it's an amendment, Typically, you don't. You're not required to make a finding of okay. completeness. It's more like it's a consensus that ad ad adequate information has been considered, has been presented to consider this amendment. Okay. Okay. A second to that motion. Can, can I ask a quick question mm -hmm. yes. before we? Um, the side lot between uh, the side the side lot adjacent to Spurwink Woods LLC is that Spurwink Woods LLC within the subdivision? Spurwink Woods LLC is another is the old name of Cottage Brook. So okay. I, I think the answer to that is yes. So it is part of the sub it yes, is part, part of, of that correct. Cottage Brook yes. subdivision. It is. Okay. And the side set this the setback line on the side is five feet? No. That's been corrected to the uh, not correct me. Twenty, 20. feet. Twenty foot side. That was in Maureen's comments. We made the changes already to address that, as well as the table in terms of what the zoning requirements are. And when you resubmit your plans next month, the board will get those plans Correct. showing the revised setbacks. Okay. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Thank you. From Liza. Um, all those in favor? And that has passed unanimously. Okay. Thank you. March 18th. Thank you. See you in a few days. <laughs> Seems mm -hmm. like it. It's not that far away. <laughs> okay. Uh
how do I shut this thing off? Okay, Maureen. Before I do something I shouldn't do. <laughs> Okay, the next item on our agenda is the normal high water line zoning ordinance amendment. The item will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide an overview and discuss any revisions of the draft proposal since our last public hearing, after which the public is welcome to comment on the amendment. After public comment, the board may begin discussion and we will conclude with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, can you provide us with an overview and an update? Yes. And I promise I won't read all eight pages of this memo. <laughs> Um, but I did try to lay out in this memo kind of your journey as a planning board with the expectation that um, you will be making a recommendation to the council soon and that the bulk of this memo could be used as your report to the council on what you, why you arrived at, where you arrived at. But for tonight, um, what you have before you is uh, the same amendment slightly restated. So I'm going to go to the second to the last page. Um, what we have done is we've kept the highest astronomical tide definition that you've seen before, and then we've taken the normal high water line definition, and we've kept the portion that applies to non-tidal waters just as it was before, and then at the very end of that, it, it has new, new language which says, adjacent to tidal waters, the normal high water line shall be the topographic line located at the highest astronomical tide plus three vertical, vertical feet upland. So that's that clean definition that you talked about at a workshop. Um, and then there's a new piece of text, and that would be um, in the Shoreland District. And what we've done is we have imported the same language you're currently using in the Resource Protection Districts, basically to identify wetland boundaries. And we've added this uh, additional language that basically says that the characteristics, the physical characteristics are on the ground are what determine the boundary of the shoreland district. And I do want to point out that in the very last line, it says, in the shoreland performance overlay district as defined above. So I'm missing a D, and now you have it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to point out is I did hand out to you tonight um, this map. and. After all our discussions, I, I do need to say again that just because there are lines on the map doesn't mean that they are perfectly located in exactly the right place. Uh, but what I've tried to do with this map is to take the astronomical high tide information that Pete Slavinsky provided you. So if you remember that Google Earth project that you zoomed in and we could see the different shadings of Hast plus one, two, and three. So I took Hast plus three, um, located the closest contour to it and show it as, shown it as a red line on this map. And then um, underneath it are the resource protection districts. And the reason I wanted to do this for you is because um, you can see at Alewife Cove, at Crescent Beach, and at the Spurwink Marsh where the um, Hass plus three makes huge incursions inland that it is actually following areas that are already zoned resource protection. 
So I had told you before and I wanted to be able to show that to you. Keep in mind that the resource protection boundary lines have to be field verified just as we've been talking about all along. But this was just to give you a sense of um, how this potential shoreland zoning normal high water line merges with what we're already doing with resource protection districts. Okay. Um, yeah. Pass plus three. Um, correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. At this time, then, um, we will be opening this up to public comment. As I mentioned at the last workshop, um, we will be having this public comment where everyone is given the same amount of time, and that will be three minutes. And if somebody would like to speak, um, please give us your name and your address. Can you tell me? Hi, my name is Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trendy Road. <clears throat> I was at the last planning board meeting, and I understand where <clears throat> the planning board is coming from with HASP plus three. Uh, and what I was concerned about is the uh, um, discussions lacked content with respect to how HAS plus three will affect the shore with respect to, for example, water runoff if new um, land becomes open for development. Um, and if I could point you to the map that I passed around, which may look similar to what Maureen put out just a few minutes ago. Um, this area is uh, <coughs> in the uh, Trendy, Trendy Point Shore Acres neighborhood uh, on Surfside Avenue, the, the um, gravel road piece of that, and the lots uh, on that road. Uh, the blue line is what is uh, reflected in the shoreland zoning map right now. The red line is actually happening. Uh, but it is very close to HAS plus three. What would be lost in the uh, official map is the yellow part. And as you can see, uh, uh, a striking amount of footage would be exposed for potential development. In fact, uh, there is one property, the Dumphy property, lot. 58, which isn't indicated on this map, but it's where the uh, pool is uh, going towards the shore. That long piece looks like a football field. That is lot 58 owned by the Dumfies. Now, uh, although it's hearsay, they have told neighbors that they would love to put a, uh, another house right on that section of property. If Hass plus three is passed without some kind of amendment or acknowledgement that this kind of change uh, would not impact where uh, the shoreland zoning map is right now, so it would save or preserve that lot area um, from development, I think that would go towards a long way to help at least protecting uh, uh, that area. Also, the, the, the idea that uh, you need to look at this problem from above versus just how the tide hits the rocks as Mr. Um, Chalet, I don't know if that's how you got so I indicated in his, in his drawing last time, which was very, <clears throat> um, uh, it, was a, it was visual and you understood, understood that piece of it, but looking at it from on top, um, you can see how the um, shoreland protection zone impacts the water runoff. It's trying, that, that area we're trying to protect so there is no water runoff that goes into the ocean and pollute, pollutes the water. Oh. So I hope this helps in indicating there is still a little bit of language that you might need to add to protect that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
everybody. I'm Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road, which I'm sure you all know very well, because I've come to every meeting but one workshop. Um, and I do understand and acknowledge what Ben wanted, and he wanted an easier way to find the starting point. I don't agree that Hass plus three or a vertical um, measure works because of the different geology and that we have in Cape. Um, but I do understand that, and I do think that with the mapping technology that we have today, that it would be really easy to identify the top of the cliff, the top of the beach above high tide, or the top of the bank. Everybody focuses on top of the bank, but our definition includes top of the cliff and top of the, the beach. Above high tide, and it also takes into account the extreme effects of the tide, the apparent extreme effects. Um, but I do think that with what we have today for technology, that it would be quite easy to identify the top of the cliff, top of the beach, top of the bank. Um, and that he, I do understand he wants a more easy, easily identifiable starting point. But I do think there are more straightforward ways that we can help him with that request that won't require an official map change. Um, I also think that when we think about shoreland zoning and the intent to shoreland zoning, it was hard to listen at the workshops that we need to listen and we, we are not supposed to speak at, um, that the rocky ledges and the hard rock was considered not a big deal because, you know, it's hard rock and it's protected. It protects itself. It's just a hard surface. But surely in zoning was to protect or is to protect water bodies from pollution. It's not just, it's not mainly, I think the um, additional uh, protections of shoreland zoning are to protect people from themselves, but it's really to protect the environment. So if you're looking at rocky ledges um, and you're looking at decreasing the amount of land that is protected, then you're looking at stormwater runoff that can easily go over that rocky ledge. And I don't agree that resource protection section in 19.2.5 can apply to rocky ledges because there are no hydric soils on top of the rocky ledge. You won't find them because they're just not there. It's scrubbed off. So, um, and I got that from a surveyor because I asked if we could locate them and he said there's no point. They don't exist on rocky ledges. So 19.25 doesn't apply, and that's what this definition is trying to do. It's trying to pull in 19.25 to apply to the Shoreland Overlay District, and Shoreland Overlay only has a couple of locations, as Maureen stated, where you see green near Al Wives Brook, um, and down here that the overlay actually is on top of that. Um, the accuracy of the map, I just have to say, how could a line on our official zoning map be 50 feet wide, which this planning board has stated on several occasions, and at the same time lie distinctly and clearly within a road that is shown right here, Broad Road, Highland Road, how could that line be 50 feet wide when it's within a 50 foot wide right of way on that map? So I think that's something you have to think about. Um, and the basis of the new definition relies on a 20-year data set. From 1983 to 2001 was the last time that that average was taken for HAST. It wasn't uh, accepted until 2003. So we're working on a piece of data that's over 13 years old, an average highest tide. That's 13 years old. Deb, it's been uh, three minutes. Oh, okay. So. And, um, and the next time it will be taken will be 20 to 25, 2025. And then after that, it'll be another 20 to 25 years. So we won't be able to look forward to another update of that until 2050. So thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? With that, then, I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'm going to ask the board for their comments and questions about our new proposal. I, I feel like I want to address a couple of things that the public said, just so that you realize that we hear your comments, that you feel heard. And the first is for um, Sheila. 
um, this shoreland zone map that you showed us, the blue line, um, that those, those lines need to be field verified. And if somebody went out today using the most strict interpretation of our standard, I'm confident that that blue line in practice, when it's field verified, would be much closer to the water. And in fact, um, in that neighborhood, when um, that line has been established in the field, it has been closer to the water. And so um, even if our very vague standard were to be interpreted in its most strict form today, I don't think that it would prohibit construction on that lot that you mentioned from everything I know and have studied. So I, I just want to say that to you so that um, you don't feel like that line is set in stone, that blue line. And then I wanted to also say to Deborah is that um, I don't think Ben McDougall was looking for an easier way to do his job. He's looking for a way for, um, to, do, to do his job better for the town and its citizens. So right now, this very vague definition um, opens the town up for lawsuit, regardless of how they interpret it. If they take the strip, strict interpretation, they're open to lawsuits from people who want the more liberal interpretation, and vice versa. And when there are lawsuits, money spent, a lot of emotional energy is spent, and it's um, a, a negative um, process for all involved. And so this is a case where we really need a strict definition. And I think Ben is actually, um, it's a testament to him doing his job better and asking for clarification here. And the town has been sued on, on both sides of this issue in the past. So, so I don't think that's fair to Ben to characterize it that way. Um, and um, so I also want to say to your comment on the HAST being based on old data, um, HAST is higher than the astronomical high tide for this year. And it will probably be higher than the astronomical tide for almost every year in that 19-year set. So it's actually a pretty conservative um, measure. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to address those um, points so that you feel like we've heard you and we've taken your comments into account. So anyone else on the board have any comments about our new proposal to be going with HAS plus three. Anyone have any comments? Yes, Peter. I just have a couple of questions on where we are. How's that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, 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 I like the, um, the simplicity and, and reliability of the HAS plus three standard, which we're headed towards. I haven't gotten there yet. But I think what we're left with in the amended language is it's, there's some logical disconnects. Uh, I'd just like to mention a couple of them. I think it's mainly a, man, a matter of untangling language. Um, because the water line is a half plus three, which is essentially up at the 100-year 100 storm, 100 storm surge level, I, mean, I think the term normal high water line is, doesn't really make sense anymore in the definition. And I would get rid of the word normal and maybe pick another one, extreme, or um, something that's a little more uh, logical. Another thing we're left with, and this is a, uh, from the current language, we have right now two categories of uh, water that we look at a high, a high water mark on. One is the what we call the inland waters, which are not defined, and then we have what we call tidal waters, which are not defined. <clears throat> um, the tidal waters has an S plus three. The inland waters go back to the old, much like a resource protection where you're looking at uh, vegetation and, and soil and whatnot. And where that line is that you pass from one to the other on a, a, a place like Yale or up in the Spur River or what have you, is not at all clear to me. Uh, and since we've adopted HASP, and then plus three for the 
you know, to pick up the, all the, the aspects of storm damage. I'm wondering if we really can identify where, where the tidal line gets drawn. And would it make sense to simply say that water is, you know, that lead to the sea uh, at the Hass line go from inland to tidal? Because there, there's a very different standard of, um, there's a, there's a three-foot vertical change when you go from a tidal uh, to a inland water. So I, I think we ought to find a way to um, make those two concepts integrate. And lastly, and then I'll be quiet, um, over on the, uh, where we actually say what the Shoreland District is, we have the three bullet points, uh, 250 beyond, and then they talk about normal high water line of any great pond or spur of the river. Well, spur of the river is really one of the uh, areas that is subject to a you know, massive uh, tidal incursion in a has plus three environment. Um, and so I'm not sure if the normal high water line there is intended to be the, um, the tidal line or the you know, the non-tidal line. And the, um, there's the category of a fresh, a fresh water wetland. And then we have a great pond, which is there an answer there, Maureen? I don't know, the, the way these three terms come together, I think, could be tightened up descriptively. And lastly, I'm not sure that new footnote, which was there for the resource protection uh, zones, makes a whole lot of sense. The, um, the zoning map based on the best available information determined by the physical features present on the site. For, or for resource zones, it makes sense for the, this one, I don't, I'm not sure it does, because this is really just a contour line. So, anyway, that's my little laundry list of things I think we ought to be thinking about. And I, I, I like the concept of half plus three, but I think we, this language has to be kind of re-engineered and tightened up. I'll throw it to you in a second, but as far as language goes, this language is from the state. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> the, so as far as the language goes, and the examples given, if you go to the state, that's where you find the Great Pond, and we've added spur, spur wink. It, it just says river, but we've added spur wink. But a lot of this language that you were asking about, and, and the term normal high water line, this is all state language, but I will now throw it over to you because I think you can explain it better. Yeah, and, and you know, if we're going to rewrite this, that means this needs to go back to another workshop. But normal high water line is a term of art that comes out of the state model language. And if you look at the shoreline zoning standards, that, that, name, that term is used over and over <coughs> and over again. So if we're going to change that, we've got to open up our entire shoreland zoning provisions and replace that. So I think what I would suggest is instead of looking at that term as the words mean what it says, it's just a name. And you can decide what your normal high water line is. And the reason that I'm going to jump to number three is the reason we have the footnote that we're borrowing from the Resource Protection District is exactly because in that definition, normal high water line, we've actually got a lot of different things going on in there. We've got the normal high water line of inland waters. And that's not one that this group has, has looked at changing because we haven't had problems with it that we know of. We haven't been sued over that definition. It's, it's the shoreland, it's the tidal waters definition that, that we've been getting in trouble with. And so if we have to go back and change that, uh, we are, we are looking at reopening all of our shoreland zoning. The, way, the reason it says the Spurwink River is if you look at the state language, it says adjacent to great ponds and rivers. Well, in Cape Elizabeth, there's only one river, the Spurwink River, and there's only one great pond, and it's actually called Great Pond. So an earlier planning board decided we would be more specific with that language and just put those names in. And to get to your question about title, I know for a fact that you can send a professional out into the field and they can identify 
when the area goes from tidal to no longer tidally influenced. Because when the town had to get um, a, a state permit and an Army Corps permit to build the bridge across the Spurwink Marsh, um, if we had been able to argue that it was non-tidal um, before we got to with a bridge location, we wouldn't have needed the Army Corps permit. But because we had someone go out there, and it was a wetland professional, and they went out there and using uh, plants and soils were able to say, this is the point where it's no longer tidally influenced. So what if you just took the hast, not plus three, just the straight hast as the dividing point, because there's a little irony here. We're, we're defining a layer of normal high water line from this ultimate reach of the tide, because it's too hard to determine. And, and yet we're, we still haven't figured out how to say where the tide and cease to affect that, the flow. But I, I, I guess I would disagree with that. I think that you can take a professional out there and they can find it because they've done it. And I get which, you a copy of that report I mean, where they said this is where it is and it's 500 feet inland of where you want to put the bridge. And so when you find that line on the tidal side of the line, you have to do HASP plus three. And on the non-tidal side of the line, you're using the definition of normal high water line for inland waters. No, I understand. And the, the only reason you've got this plus three is because you've chosen to use a contour line, but the other, the non-tidal stuff doesn't have the contour line. There's going to be a huge relationship between the contour line and where the line is and where you find your normal high water line for inland waters, but it could change. And I think, you know, when you think about the Hass plus three, think about the plus three is really, I think, there to try to get at all this water movement. Oh, absolutely. And the water movement is for the tidal waters. You don't have that same issue with water movement for non-tidal waters. Oh, I couldn't agree more. But the, at this point, is the entire Spur, Spur River um, not tidal? No, the, I can tell you what. I can get that report out, and I will oh. give you a copy, and I can show you where it is no longer tidal. I, and um, I can even show you on a map because... So in the first bullet it says normal high water line of the Great Pond, which is fine. We, we portions, of, portions of the Spurwink, Mar Spurwink River are not tidal. Some are and some are. Correct. And what we're, what we're saying right now, the where that line is, will be determined... By a professional when we need to do that. Okay. Is, is, is that the best way to handle it? Yes. Because the other thing, the other, the other way is, you, you know, you need to give me two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I have to hire professionals to to no, walk our entire shoreline. We're, we're not going to do that. Just take the Hass contour line and say that's where it changes. But it changes when you don't have tidally influenced waters anymore. That's what I mean. So right. If the if the Hass is the highest astronomical high water mark, right? Really, Hass is is. is Past is, past, is to have past, you have to have tidal waters. Right. But and where the river, I mean, every river has this, it's every river that opens and empties into the ocean has a point where it's tidally influenced and it's not tidally influenced. And the state shoreland zoning recognizes that tidal waters and non-tidal waters have different regulations. Well, I, I don't want to suggest a non-traditional solution. Is this the way that typically in the state that's how you handle it? This is state. This is state yeah. language. The only thing that we've done differently is that we're instead of using the highest annual tide, we're using the highest astronomical tide plus three feet. Right. But there will, all the other language is state language. There will be a big fat disconnect at the point where it goes from tidal to non-tidal, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, but but tidal has that water movement that you don't have as a factor in non-tidal waters. So, I mean, I don't think there. I don't think the abruptness is a bad thing if there's a logical reason behind it. So I guess you have to revisit your, 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 your original goals, where you, try, you were trying to make something that was scientifically based. You wanted to do something that could be consistently applied across multiple properties. And then the third one became that you wanted to have, maintain that environmentally strict regulation that gave Elizabeth prizes. Um, I had anticipated that, given this definition, that all of Spurwink Marsh, even the stuff that's currently not tidal because it's adjacent to tidal lands, would be captured in this Hass plus three. And I mean, I think it's 
just an academic point since it's an RP1 wetland anyway, but I thought because it's adjacent, it's HAS plus three. I think the big point to make here is the one you just made, which it's academic because it's all in resource protection anyway. And it's in a resource protection district with a 250 foot buffer, a mandatory 250 foot buffer. It's pretty strictly regulated. With the same buffer. Any other comments, if not questions, by I'd like to make a comment? I personally am ready to move this forward to public hearing if the rest of the board is ready to go there or if there so. is there any question around two feet, three feet? Are we gonna go well, to public I, hearing? I gave up one? on that argument a while back. So uh, maybe just to Because I my I would be in favor of one foot if it were up to me and I so, but well, just to maybe address that tonight, so maybe we don't get into a larger discussion during our public hearing, is when we talk about this movement in water, there's really two things to consider. Um, there is a sea level rise that scientists here in Maine, in Portland Arbor, are saying it's going to be either a, a one to two or a two to three foot rise. So two is the middle of the road. So we're looking at in the next hundred years, scientists believe there will be a two foot rise. So when you talk about um, HAST being at 11.6, within a hundred years, scientists believe HAST will be 13.6. So when we look at our definition of 14.6, we're very close to where the, the tide will be per what we've seen from Peter based on the science. Um, this is something that has already been accepted by communities such as Saco, Old Orchard Beach, um, Biddeford, and Scarborough. They're already on board with that. Kennebec and New York are also looking at putting that into their um, plans. Um, and then we also have been discussing this movement of water that, that occurs during a storm. So you have this two feet which will n not be moving, but we know the Atlantic Ocean moves and it moves quite a bit during the storms. And we've, got, we've received quite a bit of information about storm surges, coastal flooding, um, storm tide levels. And we've seen um, what those could be at a, um, a one-year storm, which happens every year. Of, you know, and we've gone down five years, 10, 25, and so on. And we look at that movement. And if you were to take the, um, I'll take the worst case scenario, the 100-year the storm, the storm tide level right now is at 14.1, but if you add in the two feet of sea level rise, it's 16.1, which is well above our proposal. So when you start thinking maybe our proposal is a little too strict, actually someone could make an argument that maybe in 100 years we'll be sitting down again and looking at a new number. But if you put the two movements together, that's why I am comfortable with going at the three feet, because just add it two feet, that still water rise of sea level rise to all the numbers that you're familiar with, and then think about the storm surges. And that's why I'm comfortable at going with the three feet. Um, I am open to either continue that discussion, or if we do have a motion on the table. Well, I haven't made a motion. I just said oh, that I okay. personally am like ready to? to move it forward. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, I thought Peter had a good point about the language on the last page <laughs> uh, where we've got the three bullets and couldn't we just say normal high water line in place of the first two bullets I, I think that might address some of Peter's points I have a thought on that yeah um, we are addressing two different things in here one is non-tidal water and the other is tidal water so by keeping the two bullets, you are acknowledging that our, there are two different types of normal high water lines. One is related to non-tidal, the great ponds, and the other is related to tidal water. So I don't see any issue with keeping them both in there. You don't, even though the definition has both. One definition covers both fresh and tidal. Because it addresses the two of them separately. It, it is a single definition of normal high water, but it specifically states non-tidal and tidal. So we're, we're keeping the same information in, the, in this shoreland overlay district. 
language. I would agree with that, but any other comments or anyone? I just think we still have an awful mishmash of language, but maybe we're stuck with it. the easiest way to think about it. On the, the has plus three, too, the, the, the overall sea level rise doesn't strike me as totally relevant, because that will show up in each recalculation path. I think the three feet is, is a conservative gesture to take into account storm surge and wave action. So if you get a Hurricane Shirley and hits a lunar high tide with a screaming onshore wind, that extra three feet is, is the buffer, which I think is intended to absorb that over a, a still water measure, which is what has to But we'll still stick with the three <laughs> instead of two or one or nothing. Okay. Uh, so then uh, three, yeah, you I'm, still go I'm forward with three yeah, plus three. I can do two also, but I think three makes some sense. Okay. Anyone else have any other comments? And if not, I will take a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the materials reviewed and the facts presented, the planning board tables the normal high water line zoning amendments to the regular March 18th, 2014 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Thank you. Do I have a second on that? Um, go with Joe on the second. All those in favor of? That's unanimous. Okay. We will be holding a public hearing on March 18th. You will have the opportunity again to speak to the board. And we do appreciate all the comments. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, we are opening it up to any um, public comments that on items not on tonight's agenda. Does anyone have anything that's not on tonight's agenda that you'd like to comment on? Okay, seeing none, then the last item on the agenda is adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? Peter, thank you. Second. And we'll go with Joe. All those in favor of adjournment and unanimous. Okay, we have adjourned. Thank you.